Um, thanks Emily and Creative Mornings and the team uh, for having me and uh, thanks for coming so early. Can everyone see okay? Yeah, all good? <laughs> cool. Uh, so I just want to flag before I get into it that I'm going to be reading a little bit uh, just because I'm usually hidden behind a webcam to present. So it's a little bit more intimidating with this many people. So <laughs> bear with me. Um, I'm going to share a small amount of work today. Uh, so please head to my Behance page or my uh, website if you're uh, interested in seeing any more. Um, it's great to see so many people, I recognize a few faces, uh, from different disciplines and backgrounds. Um, I had a look at the little, uh, list today as well. I think Creative Mornings is, um, it's, it's just great uh, to be able to come and uh, see new things and uh, meet new people. So make sure you say hello to the person next to you uh, before you leave today. Um, I hope everyone finds something inspiring from today as well. Uh, so, my name is Dan Zuko, and I work as an art director for Man vs Machine, which is a design and direction uh, studio with London, uh, sorry, offices based in London and uh, Los Angeles. Uh, you might recognise some of the work, as the studio has created idents for the BBC, ITV, Film 4, More 4. Um, and commercials for brands such as Apple, Nike, Pepsi, and many more. So I joined the studio two and a half years ago to help lead uh, projects and the European team work with the LA office. And I feel really privileged to be able to work with the studio. Um, prior to starting at Man vs Machine, I also co-owned a small animation studio in London, which I ran for eight years. But today I'm here to discuss patterns and the uh, path that I've taken that has shaped the style and workflow of uh, my personal work. I describe myself as an artist who enjoys exploring generative methods for creating playful, colorful, and uh, geometric 3D patterns, designs, and animations. I asked ChatGBT how it would describe my work. <laughs> And it replied, simple shapes for small children. <laughs> I, was, I was initially thrown by this, but then I remembered uh, the first time I showed my niece one of my animations. So that was actually the first time she'd clap, so I feel like it's a pretty, pretty big compliment. <laughs> so before being an uncle and playing with patterns, um, I grew up in Tasmania, the island below Australia. And this is actually the view from my family home, uh, looking over at Hobart, the capital city. I studied at the University of Fine Art, majoring in electronic media. And whilst I was at university, I became interested in the idea of randomness. For my honours year project, I created an interactive film in Flash, so kind of showing my age there, <laughs> um, where random particles would float around the screen and on catching one of the particles with a mouse click, it would trigger a pre-recorded scene from a film I'd made. The idea behind the piece was to question whether everyone's experience was predefined or uh, because of the logic that went into creating the random particles or whether the audience was actually creating their own edit of the film by the random choices that they had made. Was the selection predetermined or was it random? Does randomness even exist? These are the questions that have been the basis of uh, most of my work since. In 2019, I left my studio and began exploring pattern and geometric design in Illustrator. I really enjoyed giving myself specific limitations, such as using basic shapes in a grid, then seeing how I might manipulate them uh, to create a more interesting visual. There's always structure to my work, um, generally because it's based on a grid system or has repeating patterns. I'm drawn to creating order, but compelled to add randomness or vice versa. However, my process was very manual designing shapes and placing them on grids. I wanted to find a more procedural or generative approach to creating more organic variations in my work. And I came across the work of Joshua Davis. 
Joshua Davis is a generative artist who created a library of classes called Hype Framework um, to allow you to use processing uh, with minimal coding. Processing, for those who don't know about it, um, is a programming language and environment uh, specifically designed for visual artists. Um, basically, Hype Framework uh, makes generative art and processing more accessible. This was my introduction to generative art. I began experimenting with simple designs in Illustrator, taking sprites and then importing them into processing using Hype Framework uh, to build some unique patterns and compositions. I then experiment with like adding multiple layers and offsetting them using blank sprites to create empty spaces in the design. I started to think about how I could take some of the generative um, approaches and processes that I was um, sort of creating into my 3D workflow. Um, I wanted to bring them to life as 3D animations with lighting and textures. So I developed a workflow using scripts and plugins that could feed generative patterns and designs that I was creating from processing in Illustrator into Cinema 4D, which is the main uh, 3D application I use. And this opened up a workflow and style which has pretty much defined the last five years of my career. Over the next year, I created a whole series of animated loops um, from the works that I was creating in 2D. I then started creating edits uh, out of the loops and made them into short films, adding music. Um, here's a film that I made during lockdown. Um, the piece explores the feeling of lockdown, anxious, staring at a wall and slowly going insane. Um, and it's also the animation that uh, my niece clapped to, so. Thanks to Boxer Toys uh, for doing the audio as well. Um, so on the back of these films and some of the other work that I'd been uh, posting on Instagram, uh, companies such as Adobe and Maxon uh, started getting in touch and licensing my designs. I was also contacted and commissioned by Grayscale Gorilla to create some visuals uh, for the release of their uh, platform plus. Um, so Grayscale Gorilla, for those who don't know, is a, the market leader uh, for tutorials, textures, and tools for the 3D industry and has been for over a decade. So I, like many others in the industry, um, have been using their tools and tutorials to learn 3D uh, pretty much since I started. So uh, I pretty much learned everything I know from uh, Grayscale Gorilla, which is pretty cool. So I was really honored uh, when they asked me to create uh, the key visuals for their website and uh, social feeds. So the Plus platform is a subscription-based uh, service giving you access to all the tools and content on a monthly basis. Uh, so the brief was to find a bold, abstract and playful way uh, to show the variety of content they had on their platform. So I'd been, uh, so as I had been, I dipped into Illustrator and started designing compositions. I then went through the process of bringing them to life as uh, 3D uh, stills. And these are probably some of my favorite images um, I've ever produced as the ideas and techniques from my personal work translated really well into a commercial project. I also started exploring more camera angles and um, more realistic textures such as wood trying to make the work as tactile as possible. I've been fortunate enough to continue working with Grace Gorilla for a further six projects over the years, and the briefs have always been very generous in that I can inject a lot of myself into the work. 
I also started introducing the iteration style of my workflow, this kind of choppy, um, quick edit uh, effect into my actual animations. Uh, this piece explored the Grayscale Gorilla wood textures and their gobos. So gobos are the lighting patterns used for emulating fake surroundings, uh, such as shadows of trees or light reflecting off water. That year I was also invited to create a course on uh, Domestica, which is the online teaching program. Uh, the course was how to work with colour in 3D and um, in design and animation. And I decided to teach my workflow, basically. I filmed a four hour course and making the course was the longest four months of my life. Uh, <laughs> and probably felt even longer for my wife having to listen to me complain about it. She's sitting right there in the yellow. <laughs> <laughs> the rewarding part of the process though was to see how others interpreted, interpreted the de design practice. I've had almost 3,000 students on the course and it's been great seeing how uh, the artwork that has evolved from my workflow um, has been created. Some really nice works there. On the back of the personal projects in the Grayscale Gorilla Commissions, um, I was hired to work with some of my favourite studios including Buck, Yumbo, The Mill, We Are 17 and Not Real. One notable project during this time was a project with Yumbo for Lego. I was brought on to animate all of the background patterns. For the new Lego Dots collection. Unleash your creativity and dot your world. Each set sold separately and multiple sets shown. I really enjoyed this job um, because I could take a lot of the workflow and skills that I'd learned whilst making my personal projects into a commercial setting um, that would be seen around the world, which is kind of cool. Um, but I had to build the project in a way that the patterns could easily be kind of changed quite quickly um, and also they had to reference an image as well so I had to kind of create a setup that that worked uh, for that um, and the patterns were also being designed by a client and they're being updated every day so the basically the setup had to be very versatile um, and it was quite complex in the end um, but I think the effects kind of cool. Whilst I was focused on teaching and working on commercial projects, the NFT boom was happening. I feel I came quite late to selling my workers NFTs. Um, I didn't understand the technology and I've still got no idea. <laughs> um, but I did like the idea of being able to create work to sell to a community and to collectors, uh, something that has always been missing from the industry. Yumbo Studios opened their own platform called Disrupt in September of 2021, featuring some of the world's best digital artists. And I was honored to be asked to submit a piece of work for the launch of the platform. I submitted a piece called First, as in my first NFT, which is this one here. Uh, Marble's roll on a wooden sculpture in an impossible loop. The piece sold and was my first artwork that I had sold to a non-commercial client. Um, so yeah, I was really happy with that. Last year, I was, um, sorry, later that year, I was invited to the Gen.Art platform, uh, which at the time was the largest generative art platform uh, and community uh, for NFTs. Uh, I was the first 3D artist they had on the platform. Before me was established sort of generative artists that were producing thousands of images, um, which was quite daunting really, because I, you know, I'm used to creating, you know, five or 10 images. So the idea of being asked to create a thousand images was a bit like, yeah. <laughs> um, it took me a few months to build a setup I liked, but then I, um, I then generated 1500 images. Uh, I limited the final collection to a hundred though, um, because it took 50 hours to render at full resolution. Um, but here's a little bit about the film. Hope you can hear it. 
My collection for Gen.R is called Closer. The collection explores the beauty of simplicity in complex systems. At a first glance, the composition looks random. But as we look closer, we can see the rules, structures and systems that define the design. Getting closer changes our perspective and broadens our understanding of the larger picture. The intention of the piece is to guide the viewer's gaze to the systems at play in the world around us and beyond. The work is made up of 30 custom 3D shapes, 30 colour palettes and 10 defining parameters controlled by 10 by 10,000 random seeds in a 3D grid. This is the largest collection of work that I've ever produced with a hundred unique artworks. I hope you enjoy it. So the collection of a hundred uh, pieces sold out in 24 hours, which was pretty, I was blown away. I was clicking the uh, computer going and calling my wife going, I don't know what's just happened. I don't, I don't, I think it was a glitch, but it was, yeah, it was amazing. I was, um, and some of the works were displayed at the Vellum Gallery in LA. Uh, it was the first time I'd, my work had been featured in a gallery, so that felt really special as well. Following the success of my first NFT, I decided to continue to further explore the idea of the hidden loop. Um, last year, I collaborated with Sheffield-based musician Yanni. I don't know if some of you might know him. Uh, An Oxford artist, Give Me Monaco, to create some Spotify visualizers for uh, their album Parenthesis. My idea was to come up with some looping, uh, <coughs> sorry, looping animations that you could sit and watch all day. Um, here's a short edit of the piece. I really love the track um, and please check out Yanni if you don't know um, his work because he's an yeah, incredible Sheffield based musician. So I created a looping animation and the action uh, looped over a period of 10 seconds. Um, I then added some camera movement, directed um, some lights to the kind of scene, to quite directional, and added some subtle gradient colour ramps to the animated objects. Um, and then combining all of these elements, I'd hoped to make the animation complex enough that it felt like it was alive or evolving over time. Um, more recently though, I've been interested in developing work in isometric systems, uh, creating a series of grounded elements and using all of the techniques that I've been exploring up to date uh, to create some really colorful and playful compositions. I've been thinking about the pieces as digital paintings, filling the compositions with details through the interaction of shapes, uh, colors, light, and subtle materials, um, whilst also playing with the kind of fundamental ideas that I've been exploring since university. I've also created a limited run of prints uh, from some of the designs and brought some with me today if you're interested in having a look. Finally, last week, um, I was at the Pompidou Centre in Paris uh, to attend the launch of the Vasali Legacy, a book curated by French artist Jeff, uh, discussing the impressions of the Hungarian artist Victor Vasali on 36 artists. I was honoured to have my work in the book with so many artists I've always admired. Uh, it was incredible, <coughs> incredible meeting them um, in the setting of the George Pompidou as well. 
Each time I've invested my soul into my work um, I've sh and shared it with the world, I've observed a consistent pattern. New opportunities, possibilities and relationships reveal themselves. New paths are forged. The more you put into the world, the more you get back. Um, at least that's how it's felt for me. I mentioned to my best friend in Australia, um, I was doing a talk for Creative Mornings about patterns and he reminded me of uh, my yearbook quote, life's patterns are seldom neat. I'm on the other side of the world uh, speaking about my work in a cocktail bar at 8am. <laughs> I think the quote remains relevant. <laughs> Thanks. You know, you said, for example, something so 10 seconds long, the image doesn't think, because I mean, to me, I just don't understand how you do it. You can say 50 hours. How much does, would that take you? 50 hours? You just... It kind of varies. I think because the NFTs were quite large uh, that I sold, um, they took a long time because there was a lot, uh, there was a lot of detail to the actual imagery as well that you have to kind of resolve and render so like things like that have a lot of shadows or a lot of detail um, take a lot longer to render um, whereas I mean those animations did take a while as well um, because I had to render them um, for different aspect ratios because Spotify uh, YouTube everything has a different aspect ratio but yeah so I mean we've, we've got render farms at work uh, that just tick over all day like you know 20 computers just constantly rendering frames, so yeah, yeah, it takes a while. <laughs> Thanks. Hey, you said you made scripts to turn your 2D work into reading. Yeah. How did you manage to fine tune them enough so you didn't even have to do anything with it? With there was still, was yeah, there's still manual uh, processes like, um, I actually found scripts rather than, yeah, I, I can't oh. code, code at all. <laughs> Hence not being a, a, a true generative artist. Um, yeah, it's more about kind of, for me, it's finding kind of generative and interesting methods to be able to just help the process along a bit more. But yeah, um, I've got a domestica course that kind of shows a, a little bit about the workflow that I've used to, to get that process in. scripts from the gorilla? No, there were actually um, another uh, sort of artist that I found uh, was using um, scripts for something else and I just applied them to my process, yeah, yeah. <laughs> With me like generative, how often do you get it where you create something and it's not what you actually pictured? Oh, a lot. How do you uh, <laughs> tweak that into what your actual vision is? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, that happens a lot and it's, that's the whole process is trying to build a system that, um, ends up creating more good stuff than bad stuff. Um, and you know, that uh, sort of initial build that you, you do is, um, is more just kind of, you know, just working things out, you know, w what might look interesting and that will kind of evolve over time and until you've just, you know, it's like drawing, drawing or painting something. Over, you know, over time you'll, you'll add more details, you'll finesse it more. Um, it's a similar sort of process really. But yeah, you can get a lot of crap initially. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah. So, so out of my depth in terms of obviously that it's a whole different world to me, but sort of thinking about this idea of, of, of generative content generally mm -hmm. and the whole sort of pervasiveness of AI. And I just wonder yeah. what your thoughts were on obviously using these tools to create something, but you know, you're a person. You 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 know you you've been commissioned by people, but also also straying into that murky water of like the obsolescence of artists and creatives yeah. as well. Um, but just I've, and, and if this is the last question, I really don't want to end on it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but just just your thoughts really on could, because one of the videos I was I heard the music and I thought, oh, that's interesting. Would, would somebody just use, say, AI to create the music if you mm. don't focus on the visuals? And obviously, great that you'd used somebody to, mm. to do that. But obviously, the temptation being to, particularly in terms of um, speed, you know, just using something like that to create the other half or something entire. Yeah. 
Um, but yeah, just obviously wanting to make sure that there's still a place for people because this is obviously so many opportunities within something like generative work. Isn't yeah. It? Yeah, it's tricky. I mean, we have these conversations at work quite a lot as well about the use of AI and um, and how it's going to change our industry and you know people's jobs and things like that. At the moment, I feel like I, I know it is affecting the industry and affecting people, um, but I kind of still see it as a tool, like, you know, like a calculator when calculators first came out, same sort of thing. Um, but um, I guess the one thing AI is never going to be able to create is soul. You, you can't put that human sort of yourself in the, into the work. And I think that can kind of, even with AI music and stuff, you can tell like at the moment anyway, I, you can tell if something's AI. And I mean, I hope that it doesn't replace, if it does replace, I think it's just gonna create a, a, a new sort of wave of jobs. We'll just have to rethink about the way we're working with AI and technology and things like that, which we've kind of done with computers and with any sort of technology that sort of comes up. Um, but yeah, I don't think AI is gonna be able to replace putting your graft and sweat and tears into something and um, make it, you know, make it more human than we are. I hope that answers. <laughs> yeah. Hey. And a positive question. Any, I mean, Kelsey, you've done a lot of really impressive stuff, but any big kind of career aspirations that you still have, so that project you'd love to work on or own? I'd love to make a video game and get into painting a little bit more as well. So kind of co combining a lot of the designs that I've been creating and uh, bringing them into, yeah, a sort of craft like painting or something like that. Uh, so two things I want to hit off the kind of bucket list at some point. Yeah. I'm good. Thank you so much, Dan. That was amazing. Cool. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you.